Good morning. Let's sing together. Hey, that was a toe-tapping beginning to the service, right? If you weren't tapping your toe, there's something wrong with you. I even saw Pastor Tony's bad leg, his little toe going like this, just a little bit, right? So it's good to have Tony back with us today, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We are going to be blessed by just uh, hearing him open God's Word and just hearing God speak to, uh, to us through him today. We're excited about that. Uh, excited about what the, the worship team brings to us as we get an opportunity to worship a living God today through song and through opening His Word. I hope you guys are excited to be here uh, out in the cafe area. As I always say, these, these ladies, that they work hard to make sure that you feel comfortable. So if you need an extra cup of coffee or a bottle of water or a glass of water, a bagel donut, uh, that's there for you. So go and partake, bring it in here. And just enjoy today, experience God today the way that you need to experience Him. We're starting a new, uh, uh, a new, a, uh, a new series. series. Thank you, Pastor Tony. A new series this week. It's called Christmas Is. It's, just, it's not just you, Doug. Just, it's, we all get a loss for words at time. Uh, new series this week, and it's called Christmas Is. Uh, Christmas is a time for celebration is what we're going to talk about today. It's also a time for salvation and a time for reconciliation. So put it on your calendars. Make sure you're here uh, each week. Uh, if, you're not, uh, if you're not able to be here, you can join us online. Uh, Pastor Dave is online uh, today, and we always have someone online as we uh, broadcast this service, and so you can, you can catch it there as well. If you're visiting with us, we'd love to know you're with us today. Uh, inside your handout, there's a little uh, uh, card. It's a connection card. 
uh, take an opportunity to fill that out just so that we can send you a card. Just say thank you for being with us. We'd love to, to pray for you or bless you in any way that we possibly can. On your way out the garage over there, you can drop it there in our giving center. There's a wood box. There's also a, a little basket over in our guest services there. You can drop that as well. Go ahead and stand to your feet if you would and take a moment to greet someone before we get going. Let's sing together.
Christmas season uh, this morning uh, as we open your word to hear the Christmas story, God. I, I ask that you would speak to us uh, to give us a new uh, a new takeaway, a new word um, from, you, uh, from your scriptures this morning um, surrounding this, uh, this day, this, uh, um, this day of joy, God, the day of hope where you came and you, uh, you rescued us, Lord. Uh, just ask that you would speak to us now as we open your word, Lord, and uh, that you would be uh, honored and glorified this morning uh, in all that we do and uh, throughout the rest of this week, God. It's in your name. Amen. Well, all right. Welcome to Northbridge, folks. It's good to be here with you. I'm so glad that uh, I'm no longer convalescing on my couch and uh, I get to uh, worship with you guys and get to lead and be a part of the teaching time. Uh, so, you know, we thought about taking uh, our series, Christmas Is, and changing it up based on my circumstances and doing a, a Dickens-themed Christmas, and I could play the role of Tiny Tim. Uh, instead, I could be Tiny Tony, but uh, we opted against that. And then my second joke to, to uh, recognize today is I recognize it and realize that some of you, your faith traditions you come from, uh, when you see crutches, at the front of an auditorium, a church, they usually end up getting thrown down on the ground, and I promise you, that's not going to happen with me, okay? I'm going to keep these things near me all the time, okay? So anyway, in all seriousness, I do appreciate, and, and on behalf of me and Dana, thank you for your love, your kindness, uh, the encouragement, uh, the cards, the meals, uh, the calls to make sure I'm still being sane and uh, you know, I'm not getting too uh, crazy. Throughout the week, uh, staying at home, whatnot, I appreciate that, and I thank you for your support, and, uh, and Dana does too, that uh, uh, love being a part of Northbridge, and this is one of those reasons of how the family comes together uh, in times of crisis, in times uh, where people are down. So, you know, all sorts of folks have asked me about recovery, and, you know, here's the reality is it's going to be a... Uh, Think of it as a marathon and not a sprint. You know, it's going to be, you're going to see these crutches for several months. So, you know, just take it one day at a time and uh, move forward. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, we're starting up Christmas, okay? Turner Household, uh, we love Christmas. Normally, uh, Christmas explodes on our home. Now, this year, because about 80% of our stuff is up in the attic, uh, you know, I tried to make an argument to my wife of let's not do any Christmas decorations this year. Let's just have a plain home. I think everyone will understand and my wife would not hear of that whatsoever. And so we, we made do. Now, she didn't get up in the attic and haul down, you know, 80 pound Christmas tree boxes or anything like that. Uh, but we made do. We figured out other things to do. And she borrowed a smaller tree from her parents and put that together. And, 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 and we do that uh, not because we feel some kind of cultural norm of, well, you got to have Christmas decorations up, but just it's a testament of how much the Turners love Christmas. We love everything there is about Christmas and uh, enjoy the decorations, enjoy the songs, enjoy the family. And, and you know, for me, uh, Christmas, there's majesty in it, there's mystery in it, the incarnation of, of Jesus, the, you know, God, the Messiah coming in flesh. Uh, you don't, you know, that doesn't happen every day. And so it's right for us to commemorate that every year. It's, you know, we take, really, you think about it, our culture, we take a month out of the season, a month out of the year to really focus on it. And, and honestly, there's parts of me that would like to do like a whole quarter, you know, would like to do three months of focusing on Christmas. And I know some of you are saying, we do. Don't you walk through the stores, you know, in October, and you see Christmas trees up already? Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that part of it. I'm talking about just, the, the stuff that we're doing like today, you know, I wish sometimes I'm thinking, boy, a month is not enough even to, to sing the kind of songs that Doug leads us through and, and uh, the band leads us through. Uh, and so for me, as I experience that Christmas is an awesome time, I recognize that there's many of us and probably there's people in this room today 
that uh, uh, you're left untouched by Christmas. Uh, maybe it's something to get through. You know, you just let's just try to get through Christmas this year. Uh, maybe for some of us, uh, we feel uneasy when we talk about the subject of Christmas, or we feel uncomfortable when it comes to dealing with Christmas. Maybe there's a few of us that when we're dealing with Christmas and dealing with family members uh, with Christmas, we're just plain bitter when it comes to the subject of Christmas. Let me tell you that, uh, you know, you might, that might be you and you're feeling some guilt feelings right now and thinking, oh, here I go. I'm going to get called out by Pastor Tony. You know, I'm going to be told to have a better attitude in this. Let me just say that God cares how you feel. He understands, and, and I do too, you know, and that's why we're talking and spending the next three weeks looking at what Christmas is, because I would subscribe that uh, sometimes when we have those kinds of feelings about Christmas, it's because we really don't understand what Christmas truly is, and we have allowed the world or culture or family or, or whoever, friends, neighbors, to redefine what Christmas really is for us. So we're going to spend the next three weeks talking about what is Christmas? And today in your notes, you've, if you've already looked, you know we're going to talk about today that Christmas is celebration. It's celebration. And so we have so many things to celebrate. And that really is the first question of the day is, you know, what are you celebrating this season? So right now, most of us are kind of paired up. There's a couple of people that are, are solo. So, you know, have a conversation with yourself if you don't want to get up. Okay, that's fine. But just spend 30 seconds right now and, and talk to your neighbor about what it is you're celebrating this season. Is there something that kind of stands out uh, among the other things that you're really focusing on? What is it you're celebrating? Just 30 seconds real quick. So a couple of years ago, CBS commissioned a study, a poll, in which they were asking just people on the street, uh, nothing scientific about it, uh, but they were just asking this, uh, somewhere in New York, uh, shoppers as they were walking through doing all their shopping and getting all their daily stuff done, you know, what are they celebrating during Christmas? And uh, several interesting things came up, uh, some answers that, uh, again, not scientific by any means, but these were some of the things that got to the top of the list. The first thing was uh, several people said just they're celebrating the fact that they made it through another year. Just, we survived. We just made it, you know. That, that was celebration there. Uh, some people celebrated the fact that Christmas meant they got a couple of extra days off work. And so they could celebrate the fact they didn't have to go into work uh, five days that week, but only three. Uh, there are some people that celebrated a bonus. Christmas bonus came. And so that gave us a little extra change in the purse. Uh, there were uh, some people, of course, this is, this is prevalent in, in the day and age that we live in our culture. Uh, several people were celebrating that a son or a daughter uh, was coming home from Afghanistan. And so that was reason for them to celebrate. A good, a good thing to celebrate. That's something to definitely celebrate. Uh, some people at that time of the year were celebrating that their candidate got elected into office that that season and so you know that happened in november that high from winning there uh still hadn't gone down yet for them and so they were celebrating their candidate won p political office uh, there were some people that just celebrated the fact that they were done with shopping for the year no more shopping and then there are others that were just saying we are not celebrating anything we're just trying to survive you know just if we could just make it then that's good enough for us now, let me tell you, that whole list, there's some good things. There's some, you know, a lot of things that are just neutral. They're not good or bad. But, but all of those things on the list, uh, many of them deserve celebration of some kind. But let me tell you, if that is the focus, if those things are the sole focus of what Christmas is about, you're far short. You're far short. And so let's just start at the very beginning, looking at the first Christmas when the angels come and announce Jesus' presence uh, on this earth to the shepherds. It's found in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And uh, we should have that on the screen. And we don't do this often, but I'm going to invite you to read along with me this, uh, this passage. Uh, as This is kind of the focal point. This is going to be our launching point for talking about Christmas is a celebration. Uh, Luke 2, 10 says this, 
But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Don't be afraid! You know, which would make sense. When you see angels crashing into our presence, crashing into our universe, I have a feeling I would be afraid. I have a feeling that I would be thinking, oh boy, what's going on here? And so it was necessary for the angels to say, hey guys, fear not. Don't be afraid of what's happening. And then the, the angels go on to say, we're bringing good news. Some, some texts and some manuscripts will actually say great news. Great news that's going to bring great joy to all people. There's the stage for our Christmas. How can we not celebrate when we're being told about Christmas is a thing of great news. Great news is coming for all people. Uh, and they're going to have great joy through it uh, and because of it. So uh, if Christmas is a time of celebration because of, of this passage, why? Why? Uh, let's, let's take time to think about why. Why is this great news? Jesus coming to earth. God coming in a body, God coming in flesh and being one of us, walking amongst us for a lifetime. Why is that gr good news? Why should that be great joy in our life? And, you know, I've come up with a couple of conclusions as I just process that and think about it and reflect on Christmas, the, these last 40 years that I've celebrated Christmases. Uh, first of all, uh, Christmas is a time of celebration because it is a time that we are reminded that God is with you. Christmas is a time in which God is present. He is with you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 reminds us. It says, don't love money. Don't be satisfied with what you, be, but be, be satisfied with what you have for God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you because God is with us. Uh, we have no reason to fear abandonment. God is present with us right now. Uh, that's the reality we live in. Now, I recognize that probably if we were just, just gut honest with one another, and if I said, hey, show of hands here, who here believes God is nowhere around him right now? Probably there would be more people raising their hands than not. I understand that. And let me tell you, this is not a time for me to sh wag my finger at you and tell you to have greater faith or more faith. I, I, I say this, I say, I, I get it. I understand. I, I felt alone too. Uh, trust me, when I'm headed down the stairs, you know, turning upside down. There's a couple times where I'm sitting there going, God, where are you in this? Well, let me tell you, where he was was he saved my son, you know. That's pretty, um, I didn't mean that, I'm sorry. Uh, that was pretty powerful for me. Um, but, 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 but I find that it's just we all have those experiences, right, where we're just looking around going, man, if God was really for me, why would I have to go through this? If God was for me, if he was, if he was with me, why, why did someone so close to me die? If God was with me, why am I going through this divorce? If God is with me, why am I right now on the brink of financial ruin? What, you know, whatever the scenario is, we sit back and we go, God is nowhere near me right now. He probably doesn't even know my name, right? Well, let me tell you, if that's you, I, I get it. I get it. And what's happening is, is we, we have that mentality because the reality is we, we allow fear to control us. Fear is ruling the day in our lives when we say to ourselves that God is nowhere near us, that God is not with us. And now let me tell you, because we could spend all day defining fear, couldn't we? We could, we could give examples of fear, and probably all of us, uh, they would be somewhat different. There'd be different nuances. So let's just define what fear is today to help with our discussion. We have, a, we have a slide to help that. Fear, when I'm talking about fear, I'm speaking of false evidence appearing real. We, we see false things. We get data and we get things about life that, that we're reading and they're, just, they're false because our perspective is so limited. It's so skewed. We only see a partial picture. We see it even a partial picture through a dim glass or a dirty glass. Uh, and, and, and then it appears so real to us. It appears like, like we have all the information. That's fear. Now, here's a perfect, it's a beautiful illustration of what fear is. So yeah, I asked Max to help me find something online, something fearful. And Max found this picture for me. Uh, and boy, I'm telling you, I think I would be pretty fearful, a woman looking back, and you see, a, I don't know, a two-ton snail 
uh, encroaching upon you. Now, I guess the good news is it's probably not going to pounce upon you quickly so you have time to escape. But how fearful would that image be, right? Uh, you sitting down uh, somewhere in your day and you see a snail that's two tons uh, coming up upon you. I think uh, I would take note of that. But, but see that again, this is perfect fear. False information appearing real. This is what was actually being seen, okay? What, what happened, the first image that you saw was taken at a 90 degree shot. It was taken at a different angle, a different perspective that you, that you were thinking of, oh my, the person sitting there is actually about to uh, experience this, this snail bouncing upon them. But the reality is it's simply a two-dimensional drawing painted on a, a bench and on the ground. But, but when it's taken from a different angle, it looks pretty fearsome, doesn't it? Fearful. But it's just, it's just artwork. It's just a painting. It's just a two-dimensional image. And isn't that, can't we, not to oversimplify, but isn't that what so many of our fears are? You know, from a different perspective, from a different angle, we look at it and we go, oh, this is terrible, this is horrible. But if you just change your perspective just slightly, if you just veer just a little bit, whether it's because your change of perspective is from looking from a different point of view or even from just some time going through, then you sit back and you go, wow, what a total different experience. I remember that I had that experience. I uh, changed my major the year before I graduated, finished college, and uh, discovered I had to take a couple of extra classes. And so it was going to add in the semester to me. And I, I a semester to my education. And I, I completed, finished my history degree in four and a half years. And, and I was so frustrated going into that final semester. I so, and I was mad at God even because all my friends graduated on and they were moving on into grad school or into their careers and they were all scattered and, and I'm kind of alone. And, and even at this point, at one point, I was looking at my living situation, feeling like I was going to have to move into the dorms and all my friends were having fun with me about how I was going to be hanging out with the 18-year-old the freshman and here I am, you know, 23-year-old guy ready to move. You know, I, I was just, just kind of mad about it. Like, God, why would you do this? I had a plan. You had a plan, and it, it's just fallen through. You know, what's up with this? And I look back, and the, uh, uh, literally two days before I go into the, first, the final semester, you know, again, with a horrible attitude, horrible attitude, I get a phone call saying from a guy I'd never met. I, I'm sure I met him once. A uh, guy I didn't know named Nolan Carrier saying, hey, we're without a youth minister now. Would you be interested this semester coming and being an intern for us at Southgate Baptist? And right then I saw my perspective change, didn't it? Where it was no longer a curse to come and do one more semester of school, but it was this unexpected blessing. And I tell you, without doubt, if I hadn't been uh, in that experience, if I didn't have that extra semester, I would have already been locked into something else. And when I got that phone call, it would have been unavailable. I would have been unavailable and unwilling to listen to the voice of God for what turned into ultimately changing the entire trajectory of my life. You know, it's just like, wow, how God can work and move and, and the things that we fear and the things that frustrate us and the things that, that make us think that God is nowhere near us could just do a, a rad, make a radical change when, when our perspective changes, when how we see things change just a little bit. So we celebrate Christmas because the truth is that God is with us. But there's a second thing that is so important. And it's something that really a lot of people in, in, that are followers of Christ, a lot of disciples, we just don't get it. We just don't get this. But it's the truth. It's as true as anything else I say today. And that is God is for you. God is for you. You know, uh, he's not out to get you. He's not just sitting on the edge of the seat waiting for you to slip up so that he can throw a lightning bolt at you. And I, I tell you what, I mean, you, we, I, get, I understand why pagans feel this. You know, the Greeks and the Romans, when they developed their pantheons of gods, they developed, because they were developing these idols, they were developing these personas to be like themselves. That's what people do. When they create religion, they oftentimes will create and make what they are. And so it made sense that these pantheons of Greek and Roman gods that people worship were people that were 
were greedy and they were jealous. And, you know, we, there's all sorts of stories you probably grew up in school remembering of people being so beautiful the gods were jealous and so they'd do something to harm them. Or people were so successful or had so much wealth or had so much athletic ability or so much fame that the gods were jealous and they'd do whatever they could to trip them up. Well, you know, that, that mentality has crossed over in some way in our, in our faith. There, there is a mentality that God is just, wait, he just, you know, he, he totally exists to see you mess up. And when you mess up, man, he's going to put it to you. He's going to make it, he's going to make it rain in your life. It's going to be just terrible for you because God takes great pride, passion, and pleasure in hurting his creation. That, that's a mentality that we have to some degree or another. Uh, I, I know, I know beyond a shadow of doubt. Uh, if I said, huh, raise, raise your hands, who thinks that? Now, probably most of you go, well, I don't think to that level, Tony. Well, okay, but, but to some level, to some degree, that's just kind of in us to think that, that God is just, he's going to punish us. He's, he's just, you mess up in, in any area in your life, and, and, and just, you know it's going to be bad. You know something bad is going to happen. There, I had a person, a good friend of mine, uh, that asked me in all seriousness, I wasn't joking, was one, he said, well, have you, have you taken time to think about, Tony, uh, you know, when you took this fall, what, what was it? What, what was it in your sin life that caused that fall to happen? You know, why, why did that happen? You must be, there must be some sin in your life. And was, he was saying this not, out of, not to blast me, but he was concerned for me, you know. He just knew that, that God allows that to happen. He allows bad things to happen to people because people are all bad, you know. And, uh, and I just took that person and I took myself right back to when the disciples asked Jesus about the blind man that was born blind. Why, why was he born blind? Is it because he, sinned or because he sinned in utero or because his parents sinned? And Jesus said, no, he's born blind so that I, the, the world could see my glory right now. You know, And so sometimes bad things happen to good people and that just, that's the world we live in. You know, And we just got to go there. We just got to deal with it. But that doesn't diminish the fact that God is for you. He's for you. Uh, we were reminded of the passage, the prophet. Usually prophets speak real negative things, don't they? Usually warnings about how people have sinned and, and how people have fallen away from God um, and, and, and how God is going to, to draw the people back, his people back through sometimes some negative things. He's going he's gonna to sometimes, you know, some difficult times are going to happen. Well, listen to this prophecy that Jeremiah gives in Jeremiah 29 Verse 11, many of you who, you know, maybe pseudo-Bible scholars, you know this passage. Uh, reminder, the, the, the prophet writes, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good and not for bad, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. But God is for you. He is for you. I remember it because we're online. I can't give you names or specific, uh, I, you know, to keep the Turner family reunions, you know, somewhat hospitable when I come. I'm not going to give you full detail. I'm just going to say, uh, those of you who've been around for a while, you know, my, my background, I, I, you know, golly, my, my family, we're pagan. You know, we're just, uh, I'm an anomaly in my family. And, uh, and, and so have a lot of lostness. Uh, people just don't know Jesus, don't, don't know God's love for them. Uh, in the Turner household, and and so there's this one this one group that are very close to me and very close to my parents. We we'd invite them to church all the time. I remember as a kid and as a teenager, invite them, invite them, invite them. No, 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 never come. But they'd always come during Christmas, during our cantata. You know, I went to a church that had a cantata. You know, uh, for years I confused the cantata with a frittata, and I was always prepared to eat. You know, when I'd go to the, the cantata, highbrow Christmas thing. You know music, choral, you know, it wasn't a choir music, it was choral, chorale, or whatever, you know, and, and so they would come to that, they would always come to our, our cantata, I don't know why, but they would come, I don't know if it was the, okay, let's store up all the thousand invitations that Joanne gives, or Tony gives, and we'll just do it on that day to get it over with, I don't know if it was the fact that a camel would go down the front, the main row of the church and say, hey, let's see what kind of damage this camel is going to do to this church building, I don't know what it was, but they would come to that. And uh, so we went, and I remember uh, just wa sitting next to them this year. I, I was uh, in high school at the time, and uh, boy, you could feel the tension. 
You know, again, it was a great presentation. It was a neat experience. People were lovely at the church. Uh, but, but boy, uh, the, the lady the, of, the, of the husband and wife, the lady, she, in the car, you know, she did nothing but complain when we got back in the car. She talked about how terrible everyone was and how rude everyone was and how no one would let us out of the parking lot and how just terrible. I mean, you know, she just had her blinders on just to tell how horrible church was and how horrible everything was. And when we got home, her hands were bright red, red. I mean, not just from, from blood being in I mean, they were red. And it wasn't going away. We were like concerned. We were like, what is this, an allergic reaction? What's going on here? You know, what's up with this? And they stayed red all night long. And we just all kind of looked like, well, is she okay? Is, is she going to be okay? And uh, then when my mom and I, we compared notes after they left, and we realized what was happening was, was uh, she t- had taken the red bulletin, and she had wound it up like this, and she was squeezing and doing this so hard because she was just so intense and just she was just so traumatized to be there that the dye from the paper actually went onto her hands and stained her hands. Now, let me tell you, at that time, the immature Tony, and you go, there's a mature Tony? Yeah, believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not, what you see today is a lot different than when I was at 18. The immature Tony, very quick to judge, you know, oh, pagan, wicked person, can't even be in God's house, you know, without without all, you know, all this trauma and without, you know, oh yeah, what you're experiencing was you're experiencing uh, the guilt of the Lord. You know, you're being, uh, you know, God was speaking into your life and you weren't listening. You know, that, that was where I was approaching, you know, thinking, well, that's what, well, let me tell you, I started over the years, I matured and I started asking questions. I asked questions about why do you feel this way? You know, why, why is it so traumatic for you to be here and to come into this presence with these people and in the presence of God? And and I got some different answers. I, I actually shut up and listened then and listened to her story. And, and I discovered that it wasn't the fact that she was just an unrepentant sinner that, uh, that hated all things God. Because uh, she, she grew up in church, this lady. And what it was, was it was a lifetime of which her church was very legalistic, very legalistic. And basically everything that they told her that God could not forgive and would not forgive at some point in her life, she committed. And so she grew up with the understanding of how could God love me because I've messed my life up so badly, so badly that there's no one here that will recognize and, and, and will, will love me and certainly not God. God certainly won't do it. He, there's, no, there's no room for his grace in my life because I have messed up too badly to do it. Uh, and, so, and so when I come to church... I'm reminded that I'm going to hell and I'm reminded that I'm not welcomed in God's presence. So I just choose not to be there. I just choose not to go. You know, that, that was her feeling. That was her experience. And I wish, I so wish, and fortunately, but this, this lady passed away years ago when I was still in college and I'm, I'm <laughs> so thankful that I had an opportunity to decipher what was going on and get to a deeper conversation with her in which the truth could be shared that God was not mad at her. God was not mad at her. And let me just tell you today, if you're sitting back and you're saying, oh, I know the things I've done, Tony, and the attitudes I've had and the actions I've taken, I know that God is mad at me and he hates me. Let me just tell you, as an arbiter of the word of God, uh, as I'm appointed a due representative of this word, understanding this word very well, I'm a keen student of it, I've studied it my entire life. I can say with 100% confidence, God is not mad at you today. He's not mad. He's not mad. But so many of us feel that way. Why? Why do we feel that way? Well, again, we got the fear thing going on, you know, just partial perspective. You know, part of that fear is, well, if someone did that to me, if I offended if someone offended me the way I've offended God, I'd be mad at them. You know, well, let me tell you, God's a little higher than you. He declares in his word that my ways and my thoughts are higher than your ways and your thoughts. So just because you would hold a grudge with someone doesn't mean that God is the same way that you are. Let me just tell you that first. But, but second of all, I'd say this because I recognize, I recognize that all of us, no matter what church we've grown up in, uh, just whatever faith tradition we've been in, all of us, to some degree or another, deal with this. 
I guarantee you it's not the one, there's not just one person in this room, if I said, do you think that God gets mad at you and is angry with you? Uh, I guarantee the vast majority of us raise our hands and say, yep, I've been there at some point or another. Yeah, I think that sometimes God is mad. Now, let me make clear, because I'm sure there's some pious people here that are offended with me right now. Yes, God hates sin. Yes, God is mad at sin. But let me tell you, uh, when you think that sin equals you, you don't have a right understanding of sin. Because sin is this anomaly. It's uh, not anomaly. It's, a, it's this entity that as you read Paul in the book of Romans, it's almost like it has its, uh, its, own, it's, its own person, its, its own being. You know, it's interesting that sin is spoken about as a very personal essence that, is, that has gone all over this universe, right? And so, yeah, there's no doubt. God hates sin. Uh, but yet, because God is God, he has somehow figured out how to divide the sin from his creation. He has somehow figured out how to be able, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, to look through the sin and begin changing you from the inside out, making you different, okay? So let me make clear there. You know, I'm not giving you some gospel of, hey, you don't have to believe anything, you don't have to do anything, but God just loves you and everyone's okay. I mean, I get, you know, Jesus died on a cross for a reason, okay? So, so those of you who are, are very quick to, to you wonder where I'm going with this, I get that. But let me tell you, God's not waiting on the edge of a cloud to pounce on you because you woke up and you stubbed your toe and you had a bad thought. He recognizes that sin and he's provided a way for us to deal with it and for us to get out of that. And so the question I ask and I wonder, why, even though that's the truth of Scripture, why is it that almost all of us to some degree or another are unfamiliar with that? To the point of where, where those of us who are familiar, we, we might feel uncomfortable even uh, giving just the, just the clear and unreserved statement that God is for you. Well, why is it that we're just unfamiliar with this principle even though it is replete in Scripture? There is no doubt about it as you read through the pages of God's Word about how He is for you, about how Jesus declares, I did not come to condemn this world, but I've come to give it life. Uh, how is it that we've lost that message to some degree or another in our lives? Here's two reasons I've found, at least in my life, that I think could help you. First of all, we are unfamiliar with this concept because we have guilty consciences. We, are guilt, we, we, we have guilt in our lives. And so we, we say to ourselves, how could God love us because of da, 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 da. And what I would say, if that's you, if you have a guilty conscience and you can't accept that God is, is unreservedly saying, I am for you, I like you, I am your champion, uh, what I would challenge you to do is look at your conscience. And if it's guilty, deal with it. And so maybe this is what you need to do. The way we deal with guilty conscience is we identify what it is that we have guilt over and we say to God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you recognize it, maybe for the first time. You recognize it. Now, uh, some of you, especially those of you who've grown up in church, you push back on me. and You say, oh, Tony, I've done that. I've confessed my sins before God. And, and, and for a lot of us, when we speak about confession of sins, we think that confession is saying at some point, maybe when we were eight or nine years old or ten years old, uh, yeah, I came to God and I said, God, I'm sorry for all the sins I've ever done and I'm sorry for all the sins I'll ever do. Okay, I confess my sins. Let me tell you, that is, that is a confession where you recognize you are sinful, but that is not confessing your sins. Because confessing your sins means that as God's Spirit provokes me and prompts me and challenges me and tells me that this attitude or this action is against Him and is, 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 is hurting myself or hurting other people, then I take that attitude and I confess it. I say, God, I recognize, I agree with your spirit that this is wrong and harmful in me, and I'm asking you, Jesus, to change me inside out. I'm asking you to forgive me of that deed, and I'm asking you to begin a new work inside of me. That's confession. And now let me tell you, you know, I'm, and I'm not trying to give you something new to be religious about or to be pharisaical about where you go, okay, did I, did I, you know, every day now I've got to confess, you know, I've got to verbally... I, I, this is a spirit thing. As God's spirit provokes you and starts pointing things out, then you respond that way. 
There was a lady I dealt with, a, met a while back ago, and, and, and I'll say this up front, not someone in the church here, so you don't look around and be like, I wonder who he's talking about. Uh, I would not do that. I would not say that and, and give people that fodder there. But there was this woman who was, oh, golly, she was in her mid-60s, and she had kids, grown children, grandchildren, husband, and, and she's dealing with some, some deep pain, and I just couldn't, you know, I'm just I'm scratching my head going, what, something's a miss here. Something's going on. And, and through just some, finally, just some time of silence, she just blurted out. She said, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone in my entire life. And she began to tell me about how when she was 18 years old, before she met her husband, she, ha she had a child, she was pregnant, and she made a terrible choice, and she aborted that child. And, and her parents didn't even know about it. No one knew about it. She, it was all in her. And she thought that, okay, I made that mistake, and I can move on from there. And she thought having a husband and having a good marriage would, would take away the pain, and it did. And she thought, okay, I'll have children, and I'll raise these children and give my life to them, and that'll take away the pain, and it didn't. I'll be a great-grandmother. Didn't, didn't. All those things didn't. It was still there, and as I talked with her, you could see the, the guilt and the pain from something that happened 40 years previous. It was like it happened just the day before for her. And, and through that process, I didn't judge her. I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't have to. She was judging herself. But I helped her understand how to go through repentance. Because same with God. She, she had the attitude, if I don't talk about it with God, then, then he'll forget about it too. We can just move on. We can just move on from that ugly part of my life. And guess what? She couldn't move on until she said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did. And so I would challenge you that maybe if you have a guilty conscience, you take time to look at what is it that is pricking your heart, and you just actually take the time to say, God, I am sorry. And maybe you, it's free, and I've found, to even find someone you trust. You know, husband, wife, co-worker, small group leader, sm someone in your small group. Someone you trust, not just anybody. You've got to be wise about who you choose here. And you, you just have an honest conversation and say, let me tell you about what I'm experiencing. And I just find there's so much freedom in confession uh, and repentance when, when you experience that. And when, as I go through that, and my guilty conscience is soothed, not because of my own self-healing positive thoughts, you know, not because I play a tape over and over, not because I'm listening to the sounds of the ocean, but because I apply what this is teaching here. I take this and I put it here. Uh, that my guilty conscience is changed now. I'm standing free in front of God. And when I'm in that presence, I, I do have the ability to recognize that God is for me. And then a second reason, guilty conscience stops a lot of us from recognizing that God is for us. But a, another reason that's just as prevalent is that many of us are just plain ignorant of God's character. God's character. Uh, and now, okay, now here's the time for me to be that old school Baptist preacher that makes you feel bad, okay? Here's how you know if you're ignorant of God's character. If you say and you honestly believe, you know what, the God of the Bible, uh, the God of the Old Testament is a God of law and wrath, and the God of the New Testament is a God of, of grace and mercy. If you said that and you believe that, you're ignorant of God's character, okay? Because I find as I read the Old Testament, I see him pointing towards grace and mercy of Jesus, and as I read the New Testament, I see him pointing back to the work of Jesus on the cross. And I see that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is the exact same God, unchanging, unchanging. And so, again, now, now here's where I go back to my demeanor, who I am, okay? Because if that's you, if, if you're sitting there going, okay, based on Tony's conclusion, I'm ignorant of the God of the, of the Bible, you know, and maybe you don't accept it yet, that's okay. But you're, you can at least say, well, based on what Tony's saying, I'm ignorant of this. Here's the formula to, 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 to get out of that ignorance. Begin opening this thing up and not reading the story for the sake of the story, but begin reading this to learn and understand and experience the character of God. And as you experience the character of God through how other people have experienced God throughout the millennia, you're going to experience now a God who's not far and distant and away from you and uncaring, but a God who is near you, a God who is willing to send his son in flesh as a baby to give us a sacrifice to cut through the sin issue, to cut through the relationship issue and give us relationship with him. That's the God you'll experience. 
You know, we, we challenge people to read the Bible all the time. We give tools, make tools available. We don't do it so that it's a religiosity, a Phariseeism of, okay, you read your Bible today, you get a gold star. That's not the purpose of it. The purpose is, is I understand that the only way someone can truly understand God is not to come 50 weeks out of 52 to hear me preach. It's to come on a daily basis, on a regular basis, and exchange and wrestle with him in his word. That's where the growth happens. That's where we begin to discover God's character in our lives. And so I challenge you this season, if you find that, you know, that's just not who you've been and that's not who you are, I would challenge you to develop, take on some of those tools that we've offered. Uh, download the Version Bible on your iPad or on your iPhone and just and find, just begin the process of reading uh, about Jesus and what Jesus is doing. Begin reading about what God has done throughout the ages and you'll discover his character and he is more, he's more than a God of wrath and law, okay? I promise you that. Uh, and, and you'll see that as you develop that, you'll begin to understand the reality that God is not only with me, God is for me. And when you discover that, that is so freeing, so freeing for your life for who you are. You're not walking on eggshells. You're not waiting uh, because you went two miles over the speed limit uh, that that you're going to get zapped uh, because you understand that there's such a bigger picture than just God waiting for you to mess up. Uh, There's a bigger picture of grace and redemption here uh, that God is presenting to us. Let's pray. And Father, we come before you, whether we're here in this room or we're just somewhere else on this planet Earth watching via the iCampus. And Lord, we recognize that this is a time of celebration, so God, help us. Help us just to give the best energy possible the next few weeks to celebrate, uh, celebrate the fact that your son came to this earth. He didn't come just to be a cute baby for us to ooh and ah over, but he came to grow up as a man, to die on a cross, to rise from the dead, to show us that, that there is a way to deal with sin, to show us that he has authority over death and can lead us into eternity, into relationship with you. Father, I pray if we don't understand that, if there's anyone in this room that that that's a new concept, that's the concept that they haven't heard or they haven't really given much thought or consideration to, would would you just begin speaking to them and just, God, make this conversation keep on going. Uh, that they would find someone here that could, could have a longer conversation about what that looks like, Father. And I pray for all of us as we approach this time of celebration, uh, as we just deal with fear and doubt and sometimes wondering and understanding, do you really love us? Just, just today and this week, would you do things in our lives that would just seal the deal, just impact us in a way to remind us that you are with us and you are for us. And we thank you for that, God. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you just to stay seated and uh, use this time as a time to contemplate what we've been talking about and maybe asking yourself a, a fair question is, God, do I have a guilty conscience? Is there something I need to confess to you right now? And you can do that in the freedom of just where you're seated right now. I'll teach you guys a new song that we're going to sing during this Christmas season, so as you learn it, uh, join us in singing it.
been blessed today. Uh, it's been a great uh, morning. Go ahead and stand to your feet if you would. Uh, thank you, Pastor Tony, for that word. That we're, uh, Christmas is a time for celebration because why God is what? With us and for us. All right, make sure you are listening before I let you out of here, all right? Um, hey, a couple of announcements. Uh, if you remember a parent, if you're a parent of a, a junior high, high school kid, we'll be uh, meeting over in the youth bay uh, for lunch afterwards. Um, Christmas Eve service, 6 o'clock. Christmas Eve, and then uh, if you want to uh, pr- um, be a part of a serving project at Reed Middle School, that will be this coming Thursday uh, from noon to 2.45. Uh, what you'll be doing is wrapping gifts. Uh, the kiddos there in H, my understanding is that they have an opportunity to earn points based on uh, just different things that they do at the school, behavior and classes and grades and things like that. And they get those points and they take it to a little store that they have there and they're able to buy gifts for their mom and dad and their 
that are brothers and sisters. And so you'll be taking an opportunity to wrap those gifts for those kids so they can take those home as presents to their family. So great opportunity to serve right there. Reed Middle School, uh, Thursday from noon to 2.45. Again, I hope you've been blessed and you guys have a wonderful day.